also rise to support the election offenses amendment um, bill that is before the House. And Madam Speaker, it's important to reflect that this is one of the outcomes of the National Dialogue Committee, uh, which was established at some point in the history of this country to stabilize the political situation. And Madam Speaker, I'd like to hail those who participated as rapporteurs, as chairs, as members of the National Dialogue Committee, and even those who presented memoranda to that very important committee. We are now starting to see the outcome of the work they did in the form of various amendment laws. But we are also seeing that result in the pacification of politics. And Madam Speaker, I hope that we shall find an equilibrium where our politics is no longer highly charged, our politics is no longer tribal, our politics is no longer partisan, we'll find an equilibrium where politicians will be speaking for the good of the country. Madam Speaker, the amendments to the Election Offenses Act are straightforward and they are subject of a negotiated and a long drawn process. However, Madam Speaker, it is my view that the various pieces of legislation relating to elections in this country need a complete overhaul. In fact, Madam Speaker, I believe that we need to perhaps redefine our electoral system so that it reflects the unique char characteristics of our nation. It, reflect, it reflects our history and reflects emerging and contemporary trends. Madam Speaker, let me give a few examples of where we need to change our election laws. I have said it before that rigging of elections begins at the point of registration of voters. And Madam Speaker, it is not rocket science. And I wonder why we, the political class, cannot just accept that once you have a national identity card, that then should be the instrument that you use on the voters' day. Because the qualification to get an identity card is the same, same qualification to get a voters' card. And I have always wondered, and in my 10 years in this house, in my 10 years in elective politics, I have always wondered why that matter does not feature very strongly in our conversations around empowering the young people and around transforming our electoral system. Madam Speaker, right now you will find there are certain areas which until, uh, as, as, as at the last election, there has been no effort to recruit the newly acquired citizens to become voters. And then we are going to have a stampede, a few months to elections. We are going to have campaigns, very expensive campaigns, a few months to elections to onboard the young people as voters. Madam Speaker, how I wish as we try to come up with national consensus on various matters, we could come up with that consensus that the national identity card is sufficient for our young people and for our citizens to participate in the voting exercise. Secondly, Madam Speaker, it would be important for purposes of national security and sovereignty to ring fence our elections from foreign influence. When I looked at the process of tallying of election results at the Bobas of Kenya, I've always asked myself, what is the role and place of diplomats, ambassadors, and high commissioners at the tallying center? Madam Speaker, in the last election at Bomas, the American ambassador was very visible, was very, very visible. Her fingerprints were all over the place. The UK ambassador was all over the place. And when we asked why, we were told that the US and the UK governments were providing technical support to the, to the electoral system and to the electoral process. If there is one exercise that we must completely ring fence and keep away foreign influence, it is in our elections. Madam Speaker, I read somewhere today that if news can be fake, then history can also be fake. The history of Africa is replete with rigged elections engineered by the West. It is replete with assassinated leaders engineered by the West. It is replete with coup d'etats engineered by the West. But I'm speaker, I am a Pan-Africanist, and I believe that there are those forces out there, out of Africa, that believe that Africa should remain a dependent, and Africa should never be fully independent, and Africa should never self-determine its direction. But I'm speaker, we need a law that says that when it comes to the infrastructure, the systems, the processes, everything to do with our electoral system, we shall make it homegrown. And we have no shortage of skills, whether it is a technology. The other day, the CS Treasury was here telling us about e-citizen. 
developed by locals. It is handling billions of shillings on a daily basis or on a monthly basis. If we can trust our young people to build a system of that nature, why can't we trust them to build an electoral system so that we do not have to go to foreign countries to get that technology? Madam Speaker, even when it comes to capacity building, it should not go beyond our electoral officers making tours to those countries to see how they do it. But we should not have a, a situation where you've got an, a, a foreign-funded organization being the one offering technical and capacity building for our electoral officials and our electoral systems. I believe, Madam Speaker, even if it's just coming from ordinary revenue, even if it's coming from a specified fund, our electoral system should not be subject of multilateral or bilateral agreements. It should be homegrown because if we do so, we read our electoral system of foreign influence. And Madam Speaker, if you've read about the history of Africa and not the fake version of African history, the West always has an interest in electoral outcomes because whoever becomes the president of a country, Madam Speaker, sometimes influences the kind of relationships that country has with the West. We have seen interference in electoral systems in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Madam Speaker. Even in Kenya, Madam Speaker, I am convinced that there has been undue foreign influence in our electoral systems. And so that is part of what we need to look at in a complete and comprehensive overhaul of our election laws. Madam Speaker, the senators in this house have to spend a lot of money to get elected. Why? Because we've got an electoral system that has put the responsibility for trust and responsibility of ensuring accuracy of results on the candidate rather than the commission itself. But I'm speaker, you have heard previously when petitions have been taken to the Supreme Court on presidential election results, where the IEBC that is mandated to ensure trust, accuracy, and integrity of results, referring to returns of agents of candidates. But I'm speaker, we should not be investing in agents in elections. If we have an independent electoral body that is of the highest integrity and credibility. And it is a very expensive undertaking. Madam Speaker, you can imagine, before election day, three days to elections, all of us here as senators, when you're organizing your own campaigns, you need to call your agents to a central place to train them. You call them to a central place to give them the oath of secrecy. You have to keep them in a central place so that they are not poached by your opponents. On election day, they have to be at the polling station. They have to be at the tallying center at night. They have to sit for three, four days waiting for the results to come out. Meanwhile, Madam Speaker, you're maintaining them, paying them allowances, giving them airtime, taking care of their food, taking care of their accommodation. Election day expenses of a senator in this house, Madam Speaker, is on average 10 million Kenya shillings. That is if you decide to deploy your agents in a proper manner. Of course, there are some of us who sometimes you find you don't have strong opposition, and then you decide to uh, just ride on existing systems. But where the situation is tight, Madam Speaker, a senator will be required to have 10 million shillings for the three days pre and post election. If you multiply that by the 47 counties, we are looking at an enterprise, Madam Speaker, uh, that is uh, hundreds of millions of shillings. It's actually billions, Madam Speaker that could have been put to better use. And I've just spoken about the position of the senator, I've not spoken about the woman representative, I've not spoken about the governor, I've not spoken about the president. But I'm speaker, in the American system, it is estimated that political campaigns, and that was uh, about eight years ago, was costing 16 billion US dollars, 16 billion US dollars on politics. And that was more than the budget of half the American states. If you look at our expenses when it comes to elections, Madam Speaker, it is money that could have been directed to other places, but we spend it because we have no trust, because we have an electoral body that has not demonstrated integrity. Madam Speaker, we need to also look at the other laws that relate to spending on elections, but we can reduce that expenditure if we build institutions, technologies, systems, processes, and an infrastructure that inspires trust. But I'm speaker, it should be enough for a candidate to present themselves on election day, make sure that people vote, and trust that the IBC officials and the security officials that are there will be able to 
provide a result that reflect, reflects the voice of the people. And yet, we never trust them. When you see policemen in that hall, you feel that they've been sent by the state to rig you out. When you see IBC officials, the default mode is that they are going to rig you out. The fear is that they are going to be bribed by your opponent so that they can declare the wrong results. And as a result, our polling stations have become battlegrounds where each candidate has got two agents, five security people, five mobilizers. It is against the election laws, but it is something that happens. And that is why sometimes it takes too long for results to come out of polling stations. I'm going speaker. Interestingly also, when the tallying has been done at that polling station, candidates insist that they must be part of that entourage that transmits the results to the constituency tallying center. And then candidates insist they must be part of that entourage that transmits results to the county uh, 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 tallying center. Madam Speaker, that is a system that is broken, and we have time for us to change it. Madam Speaker, many of the countries that we look up to, what we are calling modern democracies, be it the US, they are holding their elections in November, I think 4th of November. They do not have the same system of fast past the post that they are imposing on us. Look at France, Madam Speaker. France election is a two round election for the legislature. You only win on first round if you get 50%. But otherwise, if you don't get 50%, even as a member of the legislature, you have to go for the second round. Look at South Africa, proportional representation. Look at the United Kingdom. We are talking of a Westminster style of democracy. Where did we get this mongrel of uh, first past the post? Where elections have become ethnic censors. Where people sit down and say that we the Basuba, we are many, or we the Luo, or we the Kikuyu, we are many, and so we are going to take the next election. And Madam Speaker, in the last conversation, there was something called Building Bridges Initiative. It was bastardized, it was shot down uh, in the courts of law for lack of public participation, but there were some interesting proposals. I do recall a proposal that came from the governor of Kisumu, who is currently the ODM uh, interim party leader. He had a proposal that we cannot take these Western systems in entirety. Let us try and build a homegrown solution where it is not a winner-takes-it-all approach, where it is not a fast-past-the-post, where it is not our election is not an alliance of tribes. Madam Speaker, our election has been an alliance of tribes. It has been described in many words. There have been shareholding structures. There have been all sorts of conversations and nomenclature to our politics. It is wrong because it pits communities against each other. It pits tribes against each other. And our politics then becomes a game of chess where the antagonists are one tribe versus the other. We must rethink uh, our electoral system, but this is going to take a very radical uh, uh, rethink, Madam Speaker, because when it suits those in power, then they are in no rush to change it. It is only when it does not suit them that they want to change it. And this conversation has been there from independence, and this is a conversation that brought the dichotomy between Kadu and Kanu. It was never settled, Madam Speaker, because we opted for a broad-based government at independence the way we have opted for a broad-based government today. And as a result, Madam Speaker, Jaramog Yogingo Dinga, two years later, was kicked out. They say history repeats itself. And uh, I don't know which one comes first, as fast or as tragedy, but history truly repeats itself. The things we saw in 1965 have come back to haunt us in the year 2024. The things we saw post-independence because of flawed politics of ethnicity, have come back to haunt us today. Madam Speaker, as I conclude, I want to encourage the House Parliament has a responsibility to scrutinize the report of the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission. That report should never be limited to mundane bureaucratic matters. I have gone to the IBC website, Madam Speaker. Recently, in my usual visits to my county, I like going to a polling station and telling my people that in this polling station you gave me 90% of the vote, and I want to thank you for that. In the past, the IBC had a portal where you could go and click and zoom and go all the way granular to a polling station. 
and you could tell the presidential results there, the gubernatorial, the senatorial, the, the, the constituency results at that point in, in, in time. Madam Speaker, that stopped happening. And yet we are advancing more. So we are more capable of manipulating big data. Ten years ago, the IBC had that portal. Today, ten years later, when artificial intelligence, big data, data warehouses have advanced, we do not have that visibility. Today, if you are to ask how many votes you got across the, your respective counties, unless you go and look at the form, that declaration form, we must push the IBC to be transparent. We must push the IBC to be accountable to the people of Kenya. The results of elections should not be held as a secret. We, we are not running a cult. We, we, we are running an open, free, and fair electoral system. And so, Madam Speaker, well, while I support this amendment to the Election Offenses uh, Act, I believe that a complete overhaul is necessary along the lines that Senator Kalwale had mentioned earlier. In the year 2016, when we were in this house in the 11th Parliament, there was a crisis prior to that election, and there was a bipartisan approach, a bipartisan committee. We called it the Windsor Committee, led by Senator James Orengo and Senator Kiraitu Murungi that gave us the minimum reforms that were necessary then. I believe that we have enough time not to go for minimum reforms, but we have enough time to go for comprehensive reforms. Madam Speaker, I support and I do pray that the other NADCO bills will find their way to the House for quick enactment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Newton.